Since you're here this morning, I thought I'd take an hour and a half to uh, give you a, a nice message here this morning. You know, often we are asked to think outside the box. It's a catchphrase often used in business to encourage people to come up with creative ways to solve problems. To think outside the box means to look at things in a new way. For example, you and I have in our minds the traditional image of the nativity with Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus in a stable surrounded by all the animals. I recently read about a group of first graders who got together and wrote their own version of the nativity. And in many ways, it was cast very much in the traditional and familiar way we all know. But there was one striking difference. Mary was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly there was moaning sounds coming from behind some bales of straw. And everybody knew that Mary was in labor. Soon a doctor emerged dressed in a white coat and wearing a stethoscope around his neck. Joseph, who had been pacing back and forth, turns to face the doctor, who smiles and says, Congratulations, Joseph. It's a god. You see, th there's nothing traditional or conventional about the Christmas story. God doesn't do it the way it should have been done. He breaks the rules. Yes, I said God is a rule breaker. God does things through people and for people that differ in ways from what we think as conventional or traditional. Listen to this scripture from Luke 1, verses 26 through 38. You've probably heard it before. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. The first thing we notice is that God does natural things in supernatural ways through unlikely people. In other words, God does what is impossible for you and me. One would think that God would orchestrate the birth of his son in a fairly conventional way. I would have thought that God would have chosen a nice young professional couple living in the Beechwood area in one of those beautiful mansions. And there, Mary and Joseph would have easy access to unpretentious shopping and a wide variety of excellent eateries. They would have close commute to downtown sporting events and theater and cultural activities and, of course, good schools for the baby Jesus. But you see, God thinks entirely outside the box. He chooses an unmarried, virgin, teenage girl living in the hill country of a little Middle Eastern village. Imagine that. A virgin becomes pregnant. Everyone knows that's impossible. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born to you will be called the Son of God. But God just doesn't reserve the impossible for the making of immaculate conceptions. 
You see, he also causes a postmenopausal woman, Mary's cousin Elizabeth, who was never able to bear children, to become pregnant, and to give birth to the baby who would become the prophetic voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make way for the coming of the Lord. And the scripture says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. And how does all this happen? Scripture tells us, for nothing is impossible with God. It's good to be reminded every year that God is fully capable of thinking and working in ways that we would never expect. God is not obligated to practice what we think are conventional wisdoms or cultural traditions or accepted practices. And then the second thing we notice is that God does what is inexplicable. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 21 says, Mary will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. There is something in the name. When Sarah Leaston asked that her newborn son be given the name Superman, the Swedish tax authorities declined her request. The officials were following legislation giving them veto power over names. They nixed Superman, citing its potential to attract ridicule later in life. The boy's parents wanted this name for their son because he was born with one arm pointing skyward, posed in the way that Superman flies. And Leeson planned to reapply for the name. A, a humorous comment, and he said, If it is approved, one thing is clear. Little Superman would have a name he can never live up to. You see, Mary's baby was given the name Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Jesus was the name the newborn had to live up to later in life. Again, God breaks the rules. He unilaterally extended forgiveness for all the sins of the people on this earth. That's God's love for us. The Bible says that, that love keeps no record of wrongs. The Bible says that when God forgives us, he removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says that, that when God forgives us, he buries our sins in the deepest sea, never again to be remembered against us. There is something in the name of Jesus. He saves. This is a season for giving and receiving. At the Cathedral Basilica of the Immaculate Conception on East Colfax Avenue in Denver, Colorado, over 1,600 people lined up to receive a small envelope containing a $20 bill. It was a tradition started decades ago by a Catholic priest remembered as Father Woody. Although Father Woody died in 1991, the tradition has continued through the generosity of an unnamed private donor. The caption above the Denver Post newspaper article read, Father Woody cash giveaway lightens holiday for the homeless. As each recipient held out his or her hand, someone placed the free gift in their hand. That's an image of how each one of us should respond to the mercy and grace of God during this Christmas season. We simply hold out our hands and receive the free gift of God's forgiveness that came to us in the form of a little baby, the Son of God, born in a lowly stable. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you and I are given the free gift of grace before God's throne. It's a gift we cannot earn, but we can only receive if we ask Christ to be our Lord and Savior. If you have not yet chosen Christ, then what will be your response to the God who does the impossible? How about asking God to do a God-sized work in your life? If you've not yet chosen Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then what will be your response to the God who does the inexplicable? How about asking for and receiving a God-sized gift of grace that can only come through his son, Jesus Christ. 
after all, isn't it time that you and I also start thinking outside the box? Amen.